This video shows how to approximate the sine function as a Taylor series around a point like x equals zero by representing sine as a polynomial and calculating the corresponding coefficients. Sine is a good candidate for this method because we can take its first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on, and we also know the output of the function and its derivatives for at least one point. Substituting this point zero in for x and solving for the coefficients gives us a polynomial where each time we calculate a new coefficient, the approximation gets better and better at representing sine, especially for inputs close to zero. This approximation method is so good we could even implement the function this way on a computer. Let's go through this process step by step. Start by representing sine as a polynomial. Since we are expanding the approximation around the point x equals zero, substitute zero into the equation for x. Sine of zero is zero, these terms cancel, and rearranging the equation we get c zero is equal to zero. This approximation of sine isn't very good, but it at least makes it so that the approximation returns the correct output as zero. To find the next coefficient, take the derivative of both sides. The derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of the polynomial is the result of taking the derivative of each of these expressions. The derivative of a constant like c zero is zero, the derivative of c1x is going to be just c1. From the power rule, the derivative of c2x to the second power is going to be 2 times c2x. Likewise, the derivative of c3x to the third power is going to be 3 times c3x to the second power. And the derivative of c4x to the fourth is going to be 4 times c4x to the third power. Since we are approximating around the point 0, substitute 0 in for x. Cosine of 0 is equal to 1. These terms cancel, and rearranging the equation, we get c1 is equal to 1. Now we have approximated sine as a line that passes through the point 0, 0, and that has a slope of 1. From calculus, this should make sense, because we have set the first derivative of sine and the first derivative of this polynomial equal to each other at the input 0, which makes it so that they have the same slope at that point. To find the next coefficient, take the derivative of both sides to get the second order derivatives. The derivative of cosine is equal to negative sine, and the derivative of the polynomial is the result of applying the power rule to each of these expressions. The exponents hop down and are reduced by one degree, so the derivative of c1 is zero, the derivative of two c2x is two times c2, the derivative of three c3x to the second is six times c3x, and the derivative of four c4x to the third is 12 c4x to the second. Since we are approximating around the point zero, substitute zero in for x. Negative sine of zero is equal to zero. The higher order terms cancel, and solving for the coefficient, we get c2 is equal to zero. Calculating c2 doesn't improve our existing approximation, but it does tell us that the approximation of sine of x as a line is perhaps better than we thought. In practice, if your inputs are reasonably close to zero, this approximation might be enough to calculate a meaningful result. For our purposes though, let's calculate another coefficient and then look at the process as a whole. Take the derivative of both sides to get the third order derivatives. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. The derivative of the polynomial is the result of applying the power rule to each of the expressions. The derivative of 2c2 goes to zero. The derivative of 6c3x is six times c3. And the derivative of 12c4x to the second is 24 times c4x. Since we are approximating around the point zero, substitute zero in for x. Negative cosine of zero is negative one. These terms cancel. And dividing both sides by six and rearranging the equation, we get c3 is equal to negative one divided by six. Now our polynomial is x minus one over sixth x to the third. And if we continue calculating coefficients this way, our approximation will continue to get even better. We could charge ahead, finding the next higher order derivative. The derivative of negative cosine is sine, and the derivative of the polynomial is 24c4. But before we solve for the coefficient, let's take a moment to think about what just happened. We started with our function sine equal to this polynomial, and we found the first, second, third, and now fourth derivative of both sine and the polynomial. Because we are expanding the approximation around the point zero, we substituted zero in for x. This made it so all these terms canceled and left us with the higher order derivatives evaluated at zero, 
the coefficients we are interested in solving for, and these values which are the product of applying the power rule. When we solve for the coefficients, c0 is 0, c1 is 1, c2 is 0, c3 is negative 1 divided by 6, and now c4 is 0. Notice how each coefficient corresponds to 1 and only one derivative of sine evaluated at 0. And, not only that, these higher order derivatives have started to repeat, creating a four turn cycle. Can you predict the value of c5? Really, take a moment to pause and ponder. What will the value c5 be? Well, to calculate c5, let's jot down the fifth order derivative of sine, which, because the derivatives are repeating, is cosine of x. We could add the term c5x to the fifth to the polynomial and take subsequent derivatives, like we did in the case of c4 and the other coefficients. But when we substitute 0 in for x, all of these in between terms will cancel, so instead, we can write the derivative as the fifth derivative of c5x to the fifth. Each time we take the derivative of this expression, the exponent hops down and is reduced by one degree, which is the same thing as if we had included c5 from the beginning. All of the derivatives follow this pattern because when we substitute 0 in for x, these terms cancel, and we are left with the repeated multiplication of the powers. Another way to write this pattern is as a factorial, and when we solve for the coefficients, c5 is going to be equal to the fifth derivative of sine, which is cosine, evaluated at 0 divided by 5 factorial. More generally, the nth coefficient is equal to the nth derivative of sine, evaluated at 0 divided by n factorial. This beauty of a formula allows us to do what we already did and more. Any term containing sine of 0 will go to 0, so all the even coefficients don't play a role, and substituting c5 into the polynomial and graphing it, the approximation now looks like this. To simplify, the cosine of 0 is equal to 1, and distributing the negative sign, we get this expression. Using this formula, we can calculate the next coefficient. And since the sixth derivative is negative sine, the coefficient is 0. The seventh derivative is negative cosine, so the coefficient is negative 1 divided by 7 factorial. The eighth derivative is sine, so the coefficient is 0. And the ninth derivative is positive cosine, so the coefficient is 1 divided by 9 factorial. Just like that, we have an approximation for the sine function that is reasonably accurate for a half rotation in either direction. This is really cool, because by simply evaluating the derivatives of sine at 0, we can calculate more coefficients, while also avoiding the rigmarole of calculating derivatives of the polynomial by hand. But I have to come clean about something. The point I've chosen, 0, is a special case of the Taylor series, and in order to expand around any point, we need to modify our polynomial. Let me show you what I mean using the fourth order approximation. Writing the polynomial like this, assumes we are expanding around 0. To expand around any point represented by the variable a, we need to subtract the value of a from each instance of the variable x, and evaluate the derivatives at this new point a. This allows us to choose any point to expand the series around, as long as we know the output of the derivatives for that point, because representing the polynomial like this allows us to shift the approximation one way or the other so it is centered around a. Likely choices for sine are inputs where we already know the output for sine and cosine, like the points formed by dividing a full rotation into eight equal parts. For example, to approximate around this point, which is pi divided by 4, evaluate all the derivatives of sine at pi fourths. Sine of pi fourths is equal to the square root of 2 divided by 2, and cosine of pi fourths is also equal to the square root of 2 divided by 2. The coefficient c0 makes it so the approximation has the same output at this point. The coefficient c1 makes it so the approximation has the same slope at this point. The coefficient c2 makes it so the approximation has the same second derivative at this point, and so on for all the higher order derivatives. Visualizing the Taylor polynomials for sine, we can see how, for some points, all of the odd coefficients go to 0, and for other points, all of the even coefficients go to 0. We can double check that this modification works by going back to our original setup. Let's also pretend that this is an anonymous function to generalize the process. 
We are approximating this function as a polynomial around the point A by setting the first derivative, second derivative, and so on equal to each other. We can verify that taking subsequent derivatives of the polynomial still results in the same factorial pattern in front of the coefficients. And importantly, substituting A in for x, these terms still go to zero. Solving for the coefficients, we get the higher order derivatives of the function evaluated at the point A divided by the corresponding factorial. This verifies that the modified version of the polynomial, where we subtract a from each instance of x, is correct. Not only have we verified that this process works for any point, but there's nothing specific about this process to the function sign. As long as we can repeatedly take derivatives of the function and evaluate them at the point a, we can calculate its Taylor series by finding the coefficients of this polynomial. This is how you can calculate the Taylor series of other functions, like cosine and the exponential function. However, I should mention that not all functions converge when approximated using a Taylor series. While the topic of convergence is outside the scope of this video, the Taylor series for sine does converge and is an excellent approximation of the function. In conclusion, to calculate the Taylor series of sine, find the higher order derivatives of the function. Since we are expanding the approximation around the point A, evaluate the derivatives at this point and then divide by the corresponding factorial to calculate the coefficients. We can expand around any point where we know the output of the derivatives, and expanding the Taylor series around the point zero simplifies things because x minus zero becomes just x, and all of the even numbered coefficients go to zero. The more terms we include, the better our approximation becomes. The Taylor series of sine expanded around zero is x minus x to the third divided by three factorial plus x to the fifth divided by five factorial minus x to the seventh divided by seven factorial, and so on for as many terms as you are willing to calculate.